Okay, hello. I'm going to be continuing with the OS dev here. I'm going to start with a couple small make file changes because it's been a while. We got to do that again. Um, I had somebody mention they could not get it to build on their system. They were not on, I think they weren't on OpenBSD, which is fine because not too many people are. Uh, but I know the stat command here, specifically for getting the file size, like the stat command, stat-f percent %z, that isn't standard. And it's different from how the, the Linux stat and everything works. I think theirs is like dash s or something for the size instead of like formatting percent %z. But I was going to change this to be like a little bit more POSIX compliant. So I was going to use, I think, WC, because that is, um, that's in the POSIX standard, says there at the bottom. But WC-c, and we'll get the number of bytes in a file, and that works pretty well. So we can use that for uh, for our purposes here. Okay, where I was doing my testing stuff. So I'm going to use this. Instead of the other stat-f, I'm going to use WC-c. Going to take as input our, uh, you know, our file that we're building here. So yeah. Trim the leading white space because on this one, if you use WC, it returns a value with a leading like tab or something. So I trim that off with another line here using the double hash. And then the star is like anything from the start of the line. If it's a space, which is contained within these parentheses is a space. So it gets rid of any space at the start of the, the start of, you know, our input here, our size variable that we got, which is the number of bytes. That trims off the start, unfortunately. Since the makefile uses the, you know, the pound sign here for a comment, everything following the double pound sign is, you know, visually syntax highlighting says it's a comment, even though it's not. This stuff is still evaluated. It just shows it as a, as a comment. But I'm going to put this in, you know, our, my other regular makefile. So my regular makefile here, I'm going to replace the size under the assembly file with with wc-c, we're going to take as input this file. I think that's all I'm doing right, yeah. Okay, and then to get rid of the leading white space on that, let's take in size, trim off from the front of the line every space. <laughs> that's what this is doing. And we'll put that back. You can also put that down here. Except this one will just be the at.bin. And then the same thing to trim off the leading white space. Okay, and then that, you know, these are all hidden. That's okay. All right, but let's see. See, that should still make everything fine, except there's not a closing quote, so I just lied to you. Does not make everything fine. Oh, this. I need the ending curly brace right there. I missed that curly brace. That is my bad. I missed that on both of these. Beautiful. Okay, that should be all right. There we go. So we still get the same results. It's just the WC-C would give me like this 512 or whatever. It would give me like that, but with the tab on the front. So we just chop off that leading white space, and there we go. You know, for example, it puts this. Um, and if we do the input as the kernel LD, it gets rid of the file name as well. And then the other thing trims off the white space. So that's all I'm doing there. But that is a more portable solution. That is a POSIX sort of standard. So hopefully that works the same on Linux and everywhere that has the, the WC command. And then another person said they were having an issue building for box. That involves a little bit of changes to the .box source file. Instead of doing a floppy, um, a pound sign in the box config file also counts as a comment. But instead of doing a floppy, we need something for like a disk here. Assuming we're using an ATA disk still, so I'm going to do just the first disk, the zero indexed ATA disk here. I'm going to define for box. That's ATA zero dash master. I think it's it's type equal disk uh, mode equals flats translation equals none. So this we're not saying it's going to be like LBA addressing or anything. It's not going to translate for larger disk sizes. I'm not even giving a set size for the disk. Uh, basically, but I'm saying it's a disk type. It's just going to be a flat file, a single flat binary file with the sectors on the disk, you know, an ascending order from zero starting at the start of the disk. Okay, type equals disk, mode equals flat. We also have to give it a path. So let's give it the path. And the reason is box source is in, you know, the bin folder, the bin directory. The reason I'm giving a path that is relative 
is because I'm going to put um, a box command within the make file that runs this config file. And if I call box from the build directory where the make file is at, um, then it needs a relative path to this final binary. So that's why I'm putting that there. Oh, then we do boot disk as well there. So instead of booting from the floppy, we're booting from a disk. And this will load it within box. So I'm just going to get rid of those two. So we're going to use a hard disk instead. Because normally, I mean, the floppy would work, but we're using a hard disk technically now. Drive 80. So I want to make sure that all works. So if I run box-q within that, uh, within the bin folder, it should pick up, yeah, it should pick up the changed box source file. And then we know the VGA and everything works, one, because the screen changed, but two, because in the box output we have down here, VB sets the bit per pixel, uh, the X and Y resolution says it enables it, so we know at least video's working, so that's cool. Uh, everything should work similarly in box. I do have a couple of issues that don't work in box, although they do in QEMU, and that is like some keys. So normally I used escape for the return to the caller from the calculator. I use the escape key in box. My escape key doesn't do anything, so I don't know what the deal is with that. I have to set it up differently. But I mean, the controls and everything still works. Also, I think, well, backspace does work here. Delete should work, although it does weird stuff. Um, so delete, delete is weird on there as well. But so some keys are a little off, a little different. So I apologize. I might have to look into that more and fix that. But for running this on box, that should fix you up. Just the changed config config file. But I am going to add to the make file as well. So to the make file as well, just to give people other options. I'm going to add a little box command to run. So instead of QEMU, we can do BOCHS botches box. I'm going to call it box. So you can do make box. <laughs> and this is going to run dash QF. So the dash Q again is like a sort of silent run. It's just going to skip that initial menu. If you run box, you get this menu. If you do box dash Q, it skips this menu. So, you know, we don't want to see that. We want to actually run the thing. And then the dash F will give box a config file one that isn't the default basically you can set like a path to it so that's i'm using it to set a path to our file in the other folder the dash q and the f allows you to set the config file and also uh, skip the the menu there so it just you know combines the previous two but i'm gonna say hey we're looking for this file over here and then since inside of that file I put in the specific path, it's going to offset from this path because we're calling it within the make file, which is from, you know, this other folder. So it'll pick up the relative path and we should be able to do make box and run it. That's fine. Um, I also only gave it like one meg of RAM. I could up that as well. But, you know, for those of you that need to use the box emulator, hopefully that helps you along for the most part. The shutdown doesn't work either because that's QEMU specific. I might look into a different outward for the shutdown command for box as well but you know for the most part things are, are reasonably the same that'll at least get you up and running i'm going to get started on a um, you know more of a c standard library some more functions there so mainly right now some some memory movement some helper functions i want to implement so i'm going to put in a string.h file you know in our include c folder here so i'll start on that but it will be string.h. I'll make, I'll make that. So just my little header comment there. This is gonna be for, mainly for string and memory movement sort of functions here. Put my pragma once, cause it makes me feel and sleep better at night. Um, the, I'm not doing too many though, at least for this video, and I might not even use them all in my regular files anyway, but I'm planning on doing um, string compare, string n compare, string length, string copy, string in copy and then mem set but you know th those will be like good like starter functions so string compare gonna compare a null terminated string to another string so compare null terminated we'll do string one to string two we're gonna compare them um this will return a negative value if string one is less than string two it will return zero if string one equals string two, and it'll return a positive value. If string one is greater than string two. 
So we'll do that. And since it can return positive or negative, we need signed data. So I'm going to do int16t. If I want to, I could include, should I include stream or a standard int? That's in the same folder as this file. So I could probably include that. I'm going to set it as a 16-bit a value here, just in case. An 8-bit might be fine for, you know, the negative 128 to positive 127 range, but I'll do 16-bit just in case. I don't know. Helps me sleep better. So we're going to be comparing two strings. I'm going to make them constant, so we're not going to change the values, but they're going to be, you know, pointers, character pointers, effectively, for string 1 and string 2 which makes me think of thing one and thing two from Cat in the Hat, but that's a topic for another day. But basically, I'm going to be checking while there is a value, while string one is not null. So we can just do while string one, that implicitly checks, you know, if it's greater than zero. Because if it was zero or null, because they're the same thing, um, then it would end, you know. So this this will be equivalent to while string one is not equal zero, you can just do while string one. That'd be the same, you know, conditional check there. But we're going to do that and we're going to say uh, while both of the strings are, are equal, while the first string we're checking is not null, and while both of the strings are equal, we're basically just going to keep incrementing the strings. So until we get to a point where they're not equal, I mean, the first characters may not be equal. If we're comparing A, B, C to D, E, F, they're not going to be equal, right? But we could be comparing, I don't know, temp1 to temp50 or something. The T, E, M, P would still be equal. And while the string's not empty, we'd keep iterating along. So that's, that's pretty simple. Um, but really, that's all we have to do. We can return then at the point that they aren't equal anymore. We can return... Uh, the result from the expression, string one minus string two, and that should satisfy these three return conditions. It's basically checking whatever the last character that we're checking is. Although if it's null, then this would be negative. So, and that's okay. Because if it's null, string string one would be less if there's still string two. So that would be fine. But uh, this, this pretty simple case does handle our, our use cases here. Um, I can check that by just writing this stuff to like a file. If that would help. So I'll just make a little test.c. I'll put this stuff in there. Okay, just put this on a little test file here. So let's test, you know, we'll do a, b, c, and d, e, f, right? Let's do that. We should probably end them with nulls just to be sure because that's what we're doing. This is my terrible way of doing test cases, right? I should have like asserts. Isn't that how you're supposed to do this thing? Uh, this should be a negative value, right? Uh, a is less than D, so it should give me a negative value. But I do also want to check, you know, if the strings are equal or, well, if the character is equal, it'll be zero. And I do want a positive value as well. We'll do DEF compared to ABC. So this should give a negative, a zero, and a positive value if I'm doing that. And we get a bunch of errors, which is great because I did not type it wrong or right. I'm just doing compared to the string. This needs to be a two. This thing up here needs to be a two. And it still doesn't work, that's good. Can you tell it's at night and I'm tired and I need to go to sleep because I'm not including basic syntax stuff that I should be? Implicitly declaring does not work. Yes. No, it doesn't, does it? Okay. I won't call it string compare. I'll call it like test string compare. Would that, would that help? That would be the easiest thing to do here. Let's, let's do that. Implicit declaration. Okay. Because this needs to go above here. This is me relearning C live, right before your eyes. There we go. Wow, look how hard that was. Negative 303. So that is negative 0 and positive value. Really, the character A is less than D, so it's less. These are equal. And these are greater. D is greater than A from ASCII. Okay. I'll do that for the other test cases. We'll actually do... We'll probably try asserts for the other ones, but okay. Just wanted to show this string compare does work. 
if I type stuff in right, because this needs to be the two. All right, then I had string in compare as well. We'll just copy this whole thing here, put it down there. Again, these will compare null terminated strings at most length number of characters. So I'll have another thing here, it'll be length. I'm gonna make it a constant. I'm gonna assume right now strings are gonna be 255 or less for the length, but I can always raise this number later. I don't think I changed anything else. The only other thing is I added, added a length, you know, little local variable here called i. So while string one is not null, while string one equals string two and while i is less than length, then we do this and i plus plus. But this is pretty much equivalent to the regular str compare, string in compare for this. Other than we're adding a loop check, or a length, sorry, we're adding a length check. As long as we're not up until that length, we keep checking. So, I mean, that actually does work. It's pretty, pretty simple, to be honest, but I'll do a test in string compare. So I need to add some test cases. Let's do the asserts. Testing the first four characters, so those should be equal. So I'm going to assert that the two test, you know, things are equal here. Asserting that that is zero. I want to test that we'll do up to the five here. So the one to the two. It might be easier if I make these all like, you know, 11 and 22 or so. So we'll test the one and the two. The one is less than the two, so we should assert that this is less than zero, right? Because the one is less than the two, that should be negative. And then we can reverse this and assert that the two is greater than the one by doing a greater than or zero. So I'm saying test, that string will equal test. They're both four characters. Test one should be less than test two. So this is negative. And then test two should be greater than test one. So that's positive. So let's just see if that works. If I typed it in right, which I probably didn't. And abort trap core dump. Now that is the C I know and love. Oh, I need to do I plus plus. Wow, I am a genius today. I need to actually increment our, our iterator. I'm tired. <laughs> it still failed though. So I must need to do length minus one. Everything is an off by one error. Everyone knows that, right? I must have to do length minus one. That would make more sense. Zero, negative one, one. Yep, that's what I was doing. I need to compare to length minus one because zero based indexing is wonderful. Let's just make sure the asserts work. And the asserts work, okay. Yeah, I'm a big dorky doo-doo head. We'll do length minus one. Because <laughs> zero based indexing is wonderful. String and compare will work. Okay. And I had string length, so I'll go ahead and write that up. str len. Let's get the length of a string up until the null terminator. I like putting terminator because it reminds me of, you know, old Arnie. Get to the chopper, get down now. You know, I can't do a good Arnie impression, but I do like the Schwarzenegger. He has a really good yell in Predator where he like lights the torch and he has like the mud face going. It's like, ah, I love that. That scene is great. He yells for like 30 seconds. Um, you just put that on when you're feeling bad. Put on Arnold Schwarzenegger Predator yell <laughs> where he's holding the torch. You'll have a good day. It'll at least be better. It'll get some of the stress of the day out. You know what I mean? But string length, all I'm doing for this is going to have, you know, constant string that we're getting the length from. So easy enough here to start out with. I'm going to have a length variable started at zero. And basically, I'm going to check while we're not at the null yet. So while string, we can just increment the string and the length and we can return the length. And that is my really basic string length function right there. So <laughs> while we're not at a null, keep incrementing and keep doing the length. Okay, so let's do some asserts here. Let's assert that the length of ABC is three. We don't want to include the null byte. Let's assert that that length is three, because it should be. 
Let's assert that the length of just a single character is one. Um, let's try just the null byte by itself. Should be zero. And let's just do some other one. We'll do a zero, one, two, three. This should be 10. Right, that's 10 characters, that should be 10. Okay. Let's see if all those work, and they're incompatible, because, yeah. We'll do test. All right. And I can't type. There we go. It actually works. Hey, and all the asserts passed. All right, that means we're good. <laughs> These are going to be really basic functions here, so but they, they work for my purpose here. After string length, I had string copy. My string copy function is going to copy the source string into the destination string. For mine, I'm assuming the source is less than or equal to the, dest the destination string. So just, you know, keep that in mind. This is going to return the destination string, yes. But string copy is returning the string, so... String copy... UNAT... We'll do the destination first, and the source second. And then the source string, I made a constant, yeah. The destination we're going to return, the destination can be mutable, it can be written to. Uh, and the source string we're not going to be changing, so I'm just making sure we're not going to change it with the const. So this, I'm going to use a for loop here. So for i equals zero, um, as long as the value that we're currently copying from the source string, as long as that is not a null, we'll continue our loops here. So this is equivalent to above where I have like the while string. This is just the equivalent of that here in the for loop. While this character in the string, you know, is not a null. And then we'll do an i++. plus plus. So all I'm going to be doing here is setting the destination character equal to the source character by doing that. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to return the destination string. This was the shortest way that I could do this, string copy. So I'm going to do also a string in copy. So I can copy up to a certain length of characters here. Copy at most length characters from, from the source string to the desk string. It's going to return destination string. And copy. So we're going to take a destination, a source, and again, a length. I could check if the source is not an all again. That's, that's fine. We'll do i less than length, i++. Plus plus. And that's the only difference, just checking for the length. So let's just do string in copy. Let's copy two, right? Just copy two characters. And I'm going to put the destination string to the terminal. So this should... Print A, B. Should only print those two characters. I just want to see. Hopefully it does. It says too many arguments because I didn't put it over here. Well, actually, I didn't put I minus I less than length anyway. Yeah. I really am tired. I need to go to sleep. Okay, I'll go to sleep very soon. Let me just finish this first. The man said five hours before he was done. Let's see if the I minus length works. I don't think it will. I think it'll be the same thing. No, that does A, B. Okay. Okay, so I was testing here again with the string in compare. I took off the length less than one, and that works. So I think I'm going to remove that because that was bugging me. I was like, that doesn't seem right. Just made it a regular len. Uh, so over here, the end of string in compare, this should work with just the len. I shouldn't need that negative, that less than length minus one. Shouldn't need that. So I was just checking that here. Given these two strings, you know, compare the first two letters, A and B is equal, that should be a zero. Change the des to DEF, and compare three, so it should be DEF. Compared to ABC, it should give a positive result. And then I change the des to ABC, the source to DEF, and did, you know, it's the same three away, it should be zero, three, and negative three for these compares. With the length, not, not length minus one, just the length. And uh, that did 
work. Zero, three, and negative three. So yeah, I'm gonna take just, you know. Anyway, the last little um, function I'm gonna do is gonna be mem set. So this will write length bytes or length number of bytes to a buffer, to a generic buffer. And this will return the buffer. Um, it's going to be sort of generic. We're going to use a void pointer. Ooh, scary. Void pointer. Void pointer mem set. We're going to have a pointer to some kind of buffer. We're going to have whatever byte we want to write. It's going to be, I'm just writing 8 bit bytes right now. So we can call it bytes and the number of bytes we're going to write. So what I'm going to do is set up a byte pointer here. <laughs> so we don't care what buffer size we pass, what kind of buffer we pass. I'm going to pass it a, an 8-bit pointer. And I'm going to set it to an 8-bit casted, basically, pointer to the buffer. And I'm going to have unsigned value here to count the number of bytes we're actually writing. So all i equals 0, i less than length, i plus plus. I'm going to set the uh, the pointer bytes equal to the byte that we passed in. So the buffer referenced by, you know, byte values, each 8 bits of the buffer is going to be set to these 8 bits that we pass in length number of times. So I'm assuming the buffer can hold this and that we're not going to over or underflow. Um, I might regret that decision later, but right now I'm not really even, uh, you know, worried about it. So, oh well, hopefully memset works. Um, but keep in mind, you also don't need to actually set the return values from things. So I thought that was a little surprising, but I didn't, you know, I'm not an expert in things at all. But you don't need to explicitly get the return, get the return value from this. So if you call this, but if you call something like memset, you don't need to get the return value. You can just do memset, like, you know, this buffer set like 10 fives in this buffer. You don't, you don't need to set, you know, buffer equal to this or anything. Even though this this one returns a void pointer, and these other things I think as well, like this this will return a string. You can set dest equal to this. At least for mem set here, this buffer that we're returning, we don't need to get the return value. We can just do instead of doing buffer equal, we can just do mem set and it'll work. But this is how it's set up. Um, but those are all the functions that I'm going to be doing right now, just for the standard string.h. I'll go ahead and add these you know, as include files to the kernel and the editor and the calculator and whatever we want to use these for. And I'm going to gonna try to simplify some code where I'm moving and comparing strings in the kernel and the editor. And I'll, I'll get to that next. But um, just to show, you know, where I got the info from, I did, well, that doesn't have in the manual, but each of these functions, I basically did, you know, the man pages I read in OpenBSD because that is the documentation, the man pages, they're excellent. Um, so, you know, for string compare, string in compare in this example, I kind of use their uh, function prototypes and their descriptions <laughs> and their return values, you know, similarly to how they had it set up. If I look at memset, it writes length bytes of value C. C is converted to an unsigned character, and that's why I'm using UN8T inside of my memset. This is saying it's a string B. I just called it a buffer size T. That's why I'm doing this. Just made them similar to how they're kind of laid out in the man pages. But uh, yeah, I'll go and add the um, the stuff to, we'll start it out with the kernel, I guess, and we'll go and like test this kind of stuff. I'll add it as an include file. This will be string.h and I'll go ahead and, you know, probably start like replacing these things right here where we get the input. All right, let's continue on here. I'm gonna, well, I already did include the string.h file inside of the kernel. I'm going to try to simplify things a little bit just to make them look better. Hopefully a little more, I don't know, idiomatic C or something. So for example here, where we're getting user input, we're clearing everything every time before the next line of input. So clearing the token arrays, resetting them, resetting the command string. These, you know, could be a little bit better. Instead of running through for loops, setting everything to zero, I mean, we'll do the equivalent within you know, like memset, but I think I'll use memset for this just to save some lines of code and it looks a little bit better. So like I was saying, you don't need to set the, or you don't need to get the return value from memset. It'll return, you know, void pointer to the buffer or whatever, but we can just set things manually like this. So instead of running through, you know, 50 times setting the tokens array to zero, we can do memset tokens zero 50. 
right? We can do that. That should be equivalent. So I'm writing a zero 50 times to the tokens array. So I'm just going to do this right quick just to ensure it works for a test. So that should clear it every time. We have a directory. If we go into something and then we go back, we should still be able to, you know, type all the commands. Everything still works. If we type it in right. And, uh, and we're good. So, you know, that's all good. We can save some lines of code by mem setting things here in the kernel. So I'm just going to do that for all these. Um, the tokens length array though is 16 bit, right? Yeah. We're only working with eight bit singular bytes within mem set right now. So instead of doing like mem set zero five for the tokens length array, I'm going to have to do 10 because five words is 10 bytes since it's, you know, byte granularity. We're just going to reset all these tokens, token length, token count is zero. Um, file name one and two are just bytes though, right? Yeah, these are just uint eight. So we can do that for these. So token file name one, we can set 10 zeros to it and we can do the same for the file name two. And that'll be equivalent to that. And then we can do command string 255 bytes of zero to reset that. Maybe all these running together doesn't look as good, but that's that's fine. We're going to mem set all these and just check that everything works still. Uh, the kernel did increase in size, it looks like, to 16. That's okay, because I'm doing a lot more calls here to mem set, so that is all right. This is now 16H, which means this is 20, which means this is 2C, which means I need to change the boot sector. It'll be 15, it'll be 22. We'll be reading 22 sectors. Okay, that did go a little bit fast, but that's all right. Got that down. Does everything still work? We can do this. So to ensure that, you know, multi-token lines of input works, we can do something with multiple tokens like renaming. That takes in three tokens, you know, the command, the name of the file, and the new name. And it does work because the rename worked. We can also delete. And now we can't call count because it doesn't exist, but we know multi-token arrays work, so that's good. So we seem to be good so far. That's good. Got the mem sets. Uh, the only other thing I can think of right now is after we get all these things, when we're checking for all these commands, like this is a bad way of doing it, right? <laughs> I'm checking manually if the indexed, you know, character within this array here with the, the index character in the tokens array, so our first token matches the command that we're going to do. We can do that better, um, especially since I'm comparing the length of the tokens here. A better way of doing this would be like string in compare. So if we're comparing, I'm basically going to take this this comparison right here for all of these. So this one's comparing against command directory. This is command reboot, this is command print reg, and all these are defined at the top right here, right? All these commands. So I'm going to check with string in compare if the token, the first token, so the first one, the tokens array here. So if tokens uh, compared to whatever command we're checking against, so in this case, command directory, and then how many letters do we want to compare against in these strings? How many characters? Uh, we'll do the length. We have string length now, so we don't need to hard code that anymore. We'll do string length of command directory. So if string compare for that is zero, that means they equal. That way, we don't need to do these two lines. We don't need to do the for loop. We don't need to check if the lengths are equal. We can just do this, and we don't need to hard code the length because we have the string length. And that works because our strings right here that we're getting the length from end with a null. Uh, but let's just see. This is the dir command. Let's see if that works. The kernel will probably bloat a bit in size during the course of this, but that's okay. So dir, does it work? Hey, it works. We put in other commands here. Go back. D doesn't work. Di doesn't work. Dir does work. All right, so we're good there. So we can get rid of that, reduce the lines of code a little bit.
And we can basically copy what we're doing right here with this condition for, you know, whatever commands we're going to do. So this one is command reboot, which was a show in Canada in the 90s. I think it was in Canada. It was like, you know, early kind of 3D graphics. It looked all, you know, 90s 3D like. It was like sci-fi. Reboot was a show that existed. It was interesting. Um, okay, that's reboot. This one will be print reg, prt -E reg, except that's a lowercase. All right, copy that. This is graphics test, gfx tst. So I'm replacing three lines of code with one every time because the space, but that works pretty well. Oh, I did have it to do. Fill this out later. Well, this is filled out. So I don't need that anymore. Because I did the graphics test here. Copy the line there. This is halt, which I haven't really been using, but that'll just halt the CPU. Although I could clear interrupts to ensure it does, but... This is clear screen. CLS, this will be CLS, get rid of those. Um, okay, here we have, what is this, shutdown. I do need to make a shutdown for box. I got to look up what that is. And put that right here. Shutdown command for box. And then later on, I guess you'll have to do it at compile time, but I'll have, you know, you can comment out the one for QEMU and uncomment the one for box later once I get that in. Because I'm pretty sure there is one for box that you can just write a, write a word to a port and it'll shut it down. Pretty sure they have that. Okay, this is delete file, delete file. And again, I'm assuming all these are just going to work. That's why I'm not testing right now, but I will test it. This is what? Rename file. Rename file. Um, and we don't need it anymore. Okay, otherwise it does the load file. Oh, here we go. File bin. We could do it here. Except this would be file extension. If that... And this, no, this first one. No, this first one would be file extension. The string we're comparing it to would be file bin. And uh, this one I might just hard code to three, just to save time. Oh, if that equals zero, there we go. Okay, then to bin file, we'll jump to it. So that'll also check if we can run programs or load the text with this. And I think that's all we have to do. So we went down a little bit. How many lines we got? 465, we went down maybe 20 lines of code. That's pretty good. So let's check. Oh, the kernel size went back down again, too. Okay, so I got to change this back. Sometimes that happens. Uh, oh, that's going to break because the other things are now less again. This is 1F and 2B. This is 15C and 19. Okay. Um, yeah, right here. Right here, change this back. Okay, so now let's test if all the commands work and the mem set and the string in compare are working. So directory works, print reg works, graphics test works. Can we load a program? Let's see. Loading calculator works, although I don't have backspace support, but that is negative, so that's good. 20 minus 10, 20 minus 19, plus two times Four. That should be one plus eight. That should be nine. There we go. You know, the editor still works. The directory works. Okay. Halt. That'll halt everything. So it's, you know, it'll stop. Shutdown works. I think we're good. What else? Delete and rename. Delete calculator. Let's make a file right quick. Test, test, text file. And put in there, rename, test text file to test file, test file. So rename works and we can put the thing there. So there we go. 
So string in compare and mem set are working. Now that's pretty good. But then probably the majority of the rest of the video, I think I'm going to make some editor changes to get the editor more sort of up to snuff. <laughs> make it look, make it work a little bit better. Um, put in actual, or at least better, delete and backspace keys to actually work in the text editor. Um, and just get inserting and deleting text and lines and things to just, just look and act better. And I will get to that um, as soon as I can, and you'll see me in a second when I'm at that part of the video. So, All right, let's continue on here. I'm going to go through and try to simplify things or at least reduce lines of code a little bit in the editor with the new string functions that we have before I do any other more major changes to the editor. So I'll put the string h in there first. I'll just look for some use cases here where we can replace some things. Like right here, this to-do. I, I even said, find a better way to do this. This is filling basically 79 zeros inside of the blank line uh, with blank. So that's a really easy, you know, mem set, low-hanging fruit there. We want to fill in the blank line uh, with the blank. And we want to do it 78 times because the 79th one is going to be zero or it's zero based, right? We should be able to do 79. Well, that should be equivalent to that. Fill out the blank line, then we'll just cap it off with a null by doing that. That should be all right. Okay, well, we can make sure that works right quick. Just test that since I'm going to have to increase the editor size anyway. 1A. At least unlike the kernel, that's the only change we need to make, so that's pretty nice. So that was the key binds, like for this stuff, and it looks to show up the exact same, and it's good. Oh yeah, we good. Okay. All right, let's look for some other, some other low-hanging fruit here, if I have any. Surely I do. Like this, we're setting one string equal to another string right here for the file type. Uh, well, I'm not capping this off with a null, so it'd be better not to do string copy. That would stop at a null, but string string in copy will work for this. So into editor file type, I'm going to put the string bin, three characters, so the b, the i, and the n. And that is if we're doing a binary, a bin file. I can also do it for a text file, though. All right, txt. So this should fill out editor keybinds in the file type, so I can check that right quick. just to see if we have a binary file, or well, sorry, if we have another type of file, it's a text, and we see the txt at the bottom, so that did work. If I do binary file, it has bin, so that works. So if we do like a test, and I save it, test bin one, then we have it as a binary file type. Okay, and if we go test text one, it's a text type, so we're good there. We can still print them out to the terminal. We're all good. Okay. Just make sure I'm not breaking anything as we're going along here. So what is this doing? Filling out a blank sector. This we could do probably a mem set, right? If we're doing 0 to 512, that would be a use case for mem set, I think. It would be at the file pointer. 512 zeros, we'll see if it works. That's for new text files, okay. Doesn't like that, implicit conversion? Oh, because I did U and A, yeah, so that is not going to work. Unless I change the mem set and see if everything else breaks. <laughs> That's okay, I'll do a 16. I guess that is a little anemic, isn't it? Just 255. Strings are bigger than that. Let's do 16. Other ones, I guess I'll keep it, but for a generic buffer, we might want to mass fill things like with zeros and stuff. The buffers can be big, so. And that shouldn't break anything in the kernel either, you know. The new uh, testing the file, the new text file, it fills it up initially with 512 zeros. So this should be 512 zeros, right? And it is. So that looks like it did work. Yeah, 500 zeros. Okay, I think we're good there. Simple enough change, and yeah, that would work a bit better. 
go. That was this line. Get rid of that. Uh, oh yeah, here's one. So we're doing the same thing like in the kernel where we were checking the uh, the command that was entered. We can take this comparison and put it into like string compare and see what we get. So if string compare or string in compare, if they're not null terminated. ext bin, is that null terminated? That's just bin and is not. That's okay. That's why we have the in functions here. String in compare. Compare editor file type. Compare that with ext bin, three characters. If they're equal, uh, then we get rid of this, and it, then it would load a hex file, because the file type would be bin for binary. Okay. All right, let's see if we can still load stuff. These are very minor changes, but they do help in the long run. Um, I wanted to load a binary file with that, right? Let's load boot sector that loads. That's all good. Let's load a text file that loads. Okay. So we're good there. This could look a little bit better. I don't like how all this looks. I did change that and my, this is, this little window is, um, my test OS source that I was working with. I do have different changes here. Yeah. At least for this part, I did refactor it. So I got rid of these. I did get rid of these three lines and just put in, you know, the character directly. Plus the file size. So instead of, you know, getting a pointer, setting the data at the pointer and then resetting, I'll just reset the pointer, you know, I mean, here is fine. We're doing that. I'll set it after we return, I think. Oh, we're doing it anyway right here. We're resetting. Okay. So we don't need these three lines. If we just want to set a far return at the final byte and, you know, the hex file that we were editing, I can just do this. Set it directly to the final position, which would be offset by the current file size, offset from the start of the file memory, which I set to 20,000 for all these. So just set that character, that single byte, by getting a, you know, character pointer and then dereferencing that, setting it to the far return here. And then this, we don't have to do a hex program here. We can just um, call it directly, right? Yeah, I can like do this. So this looks jank, but that's okay. You know, to this line. This line is equivalent to these two lines. All right, let's continue with this. Uh, the next place I saw where we could use some string function sort of simplification improvements is here in the save hex program function in the editor, because I made it a separate function instead of including it as part of the keybind like I did in the text editor, but that's okay. Um, just setting if the current file size for a binary file that we're editing, if it's less than one sector, we're gonna fill out the remainder of the sector. Otherwise, we haven't filled out a sector yet. We just fill the whole thing with zeros. If we go to save it, like saving an empty file here. So that's all I'm doing there. But I can replace this with, you know, our mem set, just setting zeros to uh, to the file pointer here, it looks like. Instead of this for loop here, i0 to 512 minus the size modulo 512. I think we can do mem set. Uh, we're setting the file pointer to zero and incrementing it. So I can do it from the file pointer. And we can set the condition there. Set it 512 minus the file size we currently did modulo, so the remainder. 512 minus the remainder to get to 512. We can set all that to zero, although I think that is the opposite, right? I should know these things, but it's been, it's been a couple days. <laughs> um, I set the byte and then the length. Okay, so I need to reverse these. Or, uh, just put the zero there. The bytes and then the length, yes, there we go. I mean, that should be equivalent to this, but I'll just edit it out right here. Comment that out just to begin with. We'll do a similar thing right here. If we fill out one whole sector, we'll just do 512 zeros. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, otherwise we're doing the same thing up here. 
Good old duplication of code. Everybody loves it. It's not the dry principle. It's repeat yourself always. That's the principle we go for. Um, but that should be with saving the hex. So let's see if just saving a hex file works right off the bat. Make run that. So let's go to the editor. We'll make a binary file. Just do af test bin one. So we have test bin one. Let's open that back up. And we get the 500 zeros. That's good. Okay. So let's go and make another one, but make an empty file. Save it as test bin two. And see. Well, I don't have backspace support in this part of the editor, but we'll do test bin two. Hey, it's 512. It does stop short back there, but that's normal. If we open something like the boot sector, and we have the 55AA, so we know that's the 512 byte limit, but eventually I do want to make this hex editor look better as well. But we know the saving works, so that's good. At least I think it works. Seems like it works. <laughs> Save hex program, is that what I called it? Yeah, all right. Get rid of those. Cool, okay, and then we can, we did something similar above for this. I did a string copy, right? Or a string in copy, which will be fine. Save to the file type, save the string bin, we'll save three, three letters there. That should be equivalent. This I could though, this is setting the bottom message to the message, so I should just be able to copy it, especially since message i is not equal to null. String.h, that is. String copy, while the source is not equal to null, which is what I'm checking for here into the dest. So I can use the regular string copy here. Copy into bottom message, copy this message, and we should be good while it's not null. We cap it off with a null down here anyway. Um, but I'm not updating i, which is not great. I don't have a string cat function yet. That would probably be what this goes into, right? That would be better. So maybe we'll hold off on that for now. I'll do to do change to this. All right, I'll, I'll put that there. Um, but that's the only, you know, low hanging fruit here for string functions in the editor. So I'm going to go ahead and like improve some other aspects of the editor. I think for the text editor, I want to go through and maybe fix some of these to do's, but put actual backspace and delete code in. And then maybe something to delete a line and some other things. So I did some more extensive changes in my like test version of the editor. So I'm going to go and review those and be back to make the, uh, the changes in the actual editor. So I'll see you in a second. All right, so to start off with a little, a little small change, again, very small, but that's okay. I'm going to define the space character for the hex 20 because I had that in a few places. And, you know, eventually I'll get rid of all these just hard-coded constants. But right now we got to, you know, improve them, right? Um, this is the ASCII space. We have 0x20 in some places. 20,000 I want to replace as well. Eventually, that'll probably be like file location or something. We'll put it there. Right now, just replace these things with space. That makes a little more sense. We're printing an actual space here. This thing I could slightly refactor. Instead of checking if it's not equal to zero, I could just check if cursor x. That's equivalent, so I don't really need to do that. Print space between hex bytes. I'll just do that. Reduce some lines of code here. If it's just a one one liner, we can do that. That is fine. But the hex twenty. Let's just replace these with space. Um, didn't I have another one there. There we go. That's all I'm gonna do here. Slight refactoring. I don't know if I'll replace the zero x a with new line or line feed. I guess I don't know if I want to do that. But well, maybe. Maybe eventually. Uh, that one I'm going to leave as well, because that's more the ASCII encoding there. Um, but that's it. That's all for that small thing. Um, okay, I did add file modes. Oh yeah, I can't copy between windows. <laughs> uh, that's okay. 
So I added file modes just with an enum. Let me just leave this up here. There we go. That won't be confusing, right? <laughs> So what are these actually doing? What am I doing with this? I, I added file notes because I want to check. I'll, I was going to have a little check, like if we're editing a file, I'm going to have it in update mode. If it's a new file, it's going to be a new mode. So I'm just going to affect like when and how we're saving a file, if we're saving versus updating it, um, to determine if I need to change like the, uh, the file table record. You know, if the name didn't change, we don't need to change that. If the file size didn't change, we don't need to change anything in the file table, but we do still need to save it to the disk. And this is kind of a step towards that. Make a little bit more sense. We can have like a little marker in the bottom that says like, hey, you're in update mode. You're updating a file. You know, have like an asterisk or something. If I'm in a multi-cursor window and I put a space, it has like this little plus down here. Oh, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> it's a little plus saying, hey, you edited the file. It's not saved. So, you know, this is kind of something similar to that, but not, not the same. So yeah, new is going to be new file updating an existing file oh i'm checking for the null byte as well with this okay because that would be the end of the file when we're loading a text file down here an editor editor load file function going down here if we're loading a text file if it's not that long or well depending on where the end is if we don't reach a new line or we have or whatever i want to see where the end of the file is just to make it more i don't know better <laughs> Just keep loading until we reach, we don't need to load all 512 if the file size is less than 512. We just need to load up until, you know, the end of the file. So this would prevent loading past the end of the file because right now my EOF marker is, is a null byte. So I'm just doing that. Stop at end of file if not 512 bytes. There we go, I'll put that. Um, I refactored this slightly, it looks like. These lines were redundant, okay. So this else if here isn't really needed because if it's not under, if it's not less than or equal 15, uh, we're just going to print the character out. And that's all this is doing anyway. If I'm printing out an A, which I have up here, you know, we're moving down one line. We're already doing that. So we don't need to see if it's the end of line and it's also an A. That's already going to happen when we go to actually print the character and the print character function if we reach the end of the line, which is 80 characters right now. Um, it's going to move the cursor down anyway, so this stuff isn't really needed, so I can get rid of it, which is nice. So what else did I change? In the text editor, now we get to those, okay. Actually go to the function, there we go. I added a few things here. <laughs> so okay, I added something to, like where we have at the bottom of the editor when we're in there, we have the x and y position and the length of the current line. I added some more things. I added the file size just so you can look at it when you're editing. The file extension, okay. Because I did have changes to change the file extension. I will get to that in a bit when it comes up. So I know I'm just copying and pasting pretty much by manually typing it out, but... <laughs> the user will input the file extension when they first save the file. Part of why I made those file modes new and update. When it's a new file, or you explicitly choose to update like the info for it, you're going to input a file extension. So everything's not going to be txt or bin, it'll be user input. So that's, you know, an improvement there. Um, and I also guess I was changing file pointers, so I have a save file pointer and offset. But I have changed file name, okay unsaved or saved so this is a boolean pretty much but that's okay check if the file is saved or not um, i have a string for new and update this will show in the bottom of the screen if you're working on a new file or you're editing a file it'll say you know new or upd for update okay and when we first go into this we can write the key binds at the bottom of the screen.
So put the extra variables here, length, size, file extension, all these new and update. I'm gonna go ahead and print those out every time we make a change and load and edit the stuff. So here at the bottom currently we have X and Y in the length. So I'm gonna add that, I'm gonna add to that the, uh, the current size that we added here and the extension and you know the current name and everything so we don't have to print that out in bottom editor message i'm going to go ahead and add those right here so i'll go ahead and add the file size and then the file size is the length and bytes we currently have so i'll print that out as a hex value for now I do want to change some of these to be regular integer, uh, I guess decimal values, right? Base 10 instead of 16. I'll do that later though. That'll make more, that'll look better. Current file size. This thing is the current line length. I'll just go ahead and put these here so it makes more sense. This is cursor Y. This is cursor X. Okay. I guess I'll also Put these out a little bit that, that reads a little bit better so currently you know when we're writing the editor message at the bottom i'm adding the type here with the bracket and the dot i'm going to add that just directly into the string here at the bottom so we don't have to do it in the other one we can simplify that to a string copy or something uh, so i'll put that here character but basically doing like with that what that is doing in the other function. I less than 10, I plus plus. So for the 10 characters, I'm printing out the current name inside of a bracket at the bottom, and then I'm gonna print the extension next to that. Put this here, this will be a dot. So it's gonna be the file name dot extension. So this will only be three. And this will be the type, T-Y-P-E. Okay, this will be the extension. Then we'll do the right bracket. And then two spaces just to have some space. And then next to the name and extension, I'm gonna put the, the, like the newer update string. If it's a new file or we're changing the current one. And if we are editing a current file and we haven't saved the changes yet, I'm gonna put a little asterisk just to show that. That's why I did this unsaved variable here that's kind of like a Boolean. So we can just do if unsaved and we can uh, print the character, print the asterisk. I'll just do this, copy that here. There we go. Print an asterisk. So if unsaved changes, put asterisk. Okay, and then we'll print the current file mode. So we have newer update. So if we're currently in a new file, I'll put new, otherwise we'll put the update string. Else if it's update, we'll put the UPD. Okay. Then after we print everything out, we'll restore the cursor position like we are currently doing. So we can see what that looks like right now. I initialize it to new when we create a new file. Otherwise, when we load, it should be update by default, or we can change it to that. Let's see what that looks like. Currently, um, I did not put a semicolon there, of course, 334, where, here, yeah. You do need to put those in or else it doesn't work. And again, 
This is what happens when I don't pay attention. Three, three, four. Uh, commas need to be semicolons. There we go. That should be correct, and it's not. <laughs> Undeclared identifier. Nice. Do I have it initialized somewhere? Oh, it's at the top. Okay. So I had it as a global variable. We'll just add that here. So we can use it in multiple, you know, the text or the bin editor. But okay, let's set actual file modes when we're making things. So here when we create a new file, let's set it to new. Just to signify it. Um, otherwise loads. This is down at the bottom. So if it's not a new file and we're loading a file, we'll set the mode to update. Okay. I think those are the only changes right now. Hopefully that's needed for that. Let's see. Got rid of those errors, uh, except for that. And I didn't spell that right. 310. This needs to be an O. Anything else? Is that it? All right. So let's see, if we make a new other type of file, we have this stuff down here, the size is zero. We don't have a name yet, so that's blank. Default extension is text, and it says new, so it's a new file. It does not put the asterisk though, but that's okay. Uh, we can remove the extension from this as well, so I'll probably go ahead and do that in a minute, but so this is size four, it should be size five. So the file size does update, which is good. So if we save it, And then the file name gets updated. That's good. Okay, so it's looking all right so far. Um, I'm gonna put in backspace and delete support soon. Right now it doesn't work, but that's okay. And the length also is not updating correctly, but that is all right. So when I'm saving the file, I'm doing it a little bit differently. Okay. I'm saving the position first. Okay, so normally when we save a file, we go back to the beginning of the file after it's saved. I want to go back to wherever you previously were. That'll make it a little bit better for the user. So save cursor position. If it's a new file, the user can put in the file name and extension as they currently are. So this will go to remove cursor right at the bottom. Move the cursor and put the file name. Okay, and then we'll put in the extension. The user can input the extension. So it can be different than just txt for another file, for example. We'll overwrite the bottom with a blank line, and then we'll overwrite the blanks. File extension string. So this will say enter file extension. Did I already have that set up here? The ext string, did I put that in this? I don't think I put that in there. Oh yeah, I did. I put that there. Okay. So it'll say you go to enter it if it's a new file. We'll do that. Uh, and then move the cursor again. So overwrite the blank at the bottom with, you know, enter the extension. You enter in the name and then you enter the extension. So after that, we'll go ahead and enter the extension similar to the input file name function. We're just writing it in line here. Editor file type, I. So we just get in three keys from the user for the extension. That's all this is doing. And then we'll print it to screen so you can see what you typed. And move the cursor again for the next one. I'll just copy that here. 
Okay, and then if you save the file, it's no longer a new file, so we're moving it to update. And changing that message at the bottom from new to update. So now you should be able to input a user input uh, file extension. I don't think I changed the save file down here, did I? I did a little bit. I restored the cursor. Let's change that as well. So yeah, where I had this to do to restore the cursor, let's do that. Because when we save a file, we're setting these two variables, x and y, so we can restore them here. And that'll work. Then we don't have to reset to the start of the file. Okay, and if they did save, we can set unsave to zero. User save file, no more. Unsave changes, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I had some more keybinds here, but I'll get to that in a second. I want to see if this works for user input extension, because that would be a good change. Let's change now to 1B. Enter B. So let's see if that works. It is not in the hex editor yet, just the regular one, but that's okay. So if we do test, go line two, I'll save it. It'll be Ted, well, that's fine. T set text 001, so let's make it like, it doesn't matter, ASM. Okay, that updates it. So it puts the file name .asm, moves the new to update, save file to disk, goes to ASM. Okay, that's good. So now I can remove this text from this keybind string, because that would look a little bit better. So let's go ahead and do that. It writes that at the bottom. This. I don't need to do this anymore, because we're printing it out. I'll just null out the, uh, the ending there. I'll null out this. Okay. And I'll terminate, rather. The file size goes back down, as is tradition. You gotta keep editing, gotta keep changing it. Would not be annoying if it always worked, right? Okay, so now the extension's gone from over there. Let's put it here, we'll do test, test txt. Let's make it like, yeah, I'll just do ASM again. So it says it's saved, it's in update mode, so if we check, directory it is now asm so we have user input file extensions so that's good we should be able to load it as well and it puts in the name of the extension so that's nice okay so another small change we can do is now change the uh the message at the bottom here to use the string copy since that's what i wanted to do to begin with we can do that now just simply put that in, that should be equivalent. Uh, but then at the end of this, we do have to end it with a null. So how big is the editor message here? Oh, 80. Okay, we can do 79 then. And see if that works. Looks like it did. It still wrote the same thing at the bottom. So it looks like it worked. That's all good. And we load it, it's all good. Okay, cool beans. What else is new? I had a change file, I had a delete line. Let's probably do these other things first though. We can put in actual backspace and delete code. I might want to do that. There was a small change to the down arrow I did, though, here. Yeah. So everything's going to be similar, except when we're searching for the next byte for the end of the file, which I didn't do super correctly, but... So I'm just adding a check for the null here. So it could be searching for a new line or... or, well, and... In this case, it could be searching for a new line or the end of the file, so I'm just adding that check here, counting a null byte as the end of the file. 
So that would prevent a, a couple small issues, at least when we're going down to the next line. It may still be buggy here though until I do some other changes, but if we do like line two, we go up, it works. We go down, it should work. Length of the line is six, yeah. So that's okay now. That might have been buggy before. But until I put in other stuff like delete, I press delete and it, it just gets garbage. I press backspace, it's garbage. So I do want to fix that. Let's do, yeah, backspace or delete. Let's do that. Okay, backspace code here. So I'm in text editor down here around line 421 right now. Put in the backspace code. So I'm going to put that in. So backspace or delete key, they're pretty similar, except backspace goes back one space. Delete deletes from the current character position. It doesn't move back at all. So if they put in 0x08, which is the backspace, that's scan code, or they put in the delete key, we want to run whatever code is here. I'll put this may not be consistent with multiple lines and deleting at different positions. I'll just put that as a caveat while I'm working with this. So if they did a backspace and they're at the start of the line, I don't want to do anything. I could put in something for that later, but right now it's easier to just skip over that because I don't want to handle it moving a line back to the previous line concatenating on the end. I don't want to handle that, especially if it runs over the end of line character limit. I'm also not handling deleting a new line for that same reason. So if the current character that the cursor is on is a new line. I'm just skipping over that as well to make it easier. <laughs> um, if they're at the end of the file, I'm just moving back by one. Move cursor back. Because if we're, if we're at the end of file, we're going to be on a null byte. There's nothing to delete. So we're just going to move back instead of trying to delete anything and being real buggy or something else. So the end of the file, the EOF character is a null right now. So if we're on a null, and we've input something into the file. We're not on the first character that hasn't been entered yet. Um, then I'm going to remove the cursor. I'm going to go back one character on the screen. So decrement X and the file pointer and the file offset and the line length. Uh, and then I'm going to move the cursor because I don't think I'm doing that yet. Or am I doing that by default whenever we print everything? Restores the position. Uh, okay. We might be doing that. So I don't need to do that. But yeah, I'll put a continue. So if we press backspace or delete on the last character in the file, it's just going to move the cursor back. And then if we try to move, since the line length is decremented, we won't be able to move back. But it'll it'll be similar to deleting. If we want to input another character and move the you know the end of the file forward, then we'll have to insert a new character. If they put in a backspace. I want to move back one byte. Move back one character slash byte. So before we delete everything, I'm going to move back by one. But I'm saying that's really the only difference between a backspace and a delete is just we're going back by one before all the deletions happen. And the way I'm doing this, the deletions is not, well, I changed the insertions, the new characters to be the same. It's not really efficient, but that's okay. At least I don't think it is, but I'm basically taking all the file data that's after the cursor, since we move it back by one on a backspace. If we're on a delete, then it's from the cursor forward, but 
all the data there, like on the line and the rest of the file, I'm moving everything back by one character. So if we had like two lines and I was in the middle of the first, deleted or backspaced by one, everything after that would move back by one, like visually and in the file data, since we're deleting that, we're removing that character. Uh, but okay, we'll move everything back one byte. So one way of doing that was looping through I less than file length bytes minus the offset. Okay, so if we loop through all of the all of the file data ahead of the cursor, one way to do that is to go through, you know, the full length of the file minus the current offset. So wherever we currently are until the end of the file, looping through all of those bytes. And then we can move everything back by one by setting everything basically one byte ahead to the byte behind it. So the current byte is going to be the next one. You know, the next one's going to be the one after that, the one after that. So we're doing that till the end of the file, which we're probably going to reduce the length of the file by one at the end. So that'll be okay. So file length bytes minus minus. Deleted a character. That way we won't go one over and have any kind of overflow or anything. So after I basically moved all the file data back on the screen, it will not have moved back. Nothing will have changed. So I want to redraw the characters on the screen so that they're all moved back by one. And then the end of the file is erased and it's moved back by one from this length and bytes. So I got to sort of redraw everything, unfortunately. So I guess I did it only for the current line. I don't remember why I did that. I figure I would have redrawn everything, but maybe I didn't need to. But we're saving off the current position here. I'm moving to the start of the line we're on to redraw it. And until we reach a new line or the end of the file, I'm rewriting the characters here, redrawing them to the screen. So I guess I'm just redrawing the current line on the screen, even though all the data is moving back. I figure I would have redrawn all the current data on the screen, but maybe it wasn't needed. So I might change this from how I had it in testing. We'll see. But you are deleting the character from the current line, so I'm reducing the length of the current line and redrawing it. That makes sense, but I don't know why I'm not redrawing everything after that. Previous end of line now equals space. Since we, if the end of the line was like a new line or a T or something, we're going to write a space over there so that the line visually shrinks by one. That's what that's doing. So to redraw line until end of line or end of file. And then we're restoring the file position. Cursor X, cursor Y. Since we deleted something, there's been a change to the file, so I'm going to set the unsaved sort of flag boolean. I'm going to set that on. File now has unsaved changes. And then again, we'll continue. But okay, well, let's see how that works. For backspacing or deleting on the current line or in the middle of multiple lines, I can't spell cursor. So I saw 457 which is a magnum. No, that's 357. Let's put a cursor. Actually spell that right. Scan code as well. 423. Gotta have typos. All right, this is 1B. No, that's 1A. Gotta change the editor file size again. Okay. So if we go to text file, let's do test. Let's do a backspace right here. Um, but the length did update. So the T should not be drawn there. It should be a space and it was not. 
Let's try delete. Delete did work, so backspace did not. Okay. Let's try that again. TST, do enter, line two. So let's move up. I'm on the end of the line. The backspace does nothing because if it's on a new line, I had it not work. Um, if I go there, that removes it. That removes it. So it works on the second line. Can't remove the backspace, or can't remove the new line, but if I do it on the T, that does go away. And then that's the new end of line. So that works. It's just backspace does not... It's probably doing what I told it to, actually. So if I move it... Like on this N, I press backspace, it's probably going to erase the I and move the N. So that is actually correct. It just doesn't remove the end of line character unless I do a delete. That makes sense. Okay, so I think that is working correctly, actually. It just looks a little jank. And that makes sense. If we're deleting on the current line, we don't need to... I mean, we need to move all the file data back, but visually on the screen, we only need to redraw the current line because I'm not messing with the new line characters. So that does make sense. I don't need to redraw everything, just the current line. That's a little bit better. Um, the only issue is that we, I don't have a way to delete a full line of text. So if we leave multiple lines, we can delete up to the new line, but not that and move everything. So uh, when I was testing, I did a special thing to delete a line. So I'm going to put that in. Uh, basically a delete line command. Like in Vim, I mean, I can't go back and delete, right? I need to do like a, a DD to delete. I won't put in a DD. I'll put in like control D or something. I'll probably do that, because that's what I did in uh, in testing. I did that up here, right? Yeah, Control-D. So is this at S? Okay. Control-D, delete current line. So I'm going to add that to the text up here as well. Keybinds text. I'm also going to add little separators here, just the pipe character, so it looks a little better. All right, um, control D equals to save one character. I'm going to put colon instead of equals in a space because this we only have 80 to work with. Put delete line. I'm going to put return to caller, not kernel. Return to caller, control S. Let's do save file just to save some space there. I'll do delete. Delete line. Okay. Delete current line if input character is D. What did I do here? If we're on the last line of the file, we'd want to skip. So if on last line of file, skip, I'm not going to delete it. I could, I guess, and remove it to do put in deleting last line. <laughs> right now I'm just skipping to be, to be easier. Okay, and then I'm going to move all the lines after the one we're currently deleting. I'm going to move them all up by one. So really, we just need to basically update the file after our current line, move everything up by one line, and then redraw it. So that's what this is going to be doing. So I'm going to move to the beginning of the line that we're on. Uh, Offset also be this. Save off the file pointer in the offset for this line. Okay. So while the offset is less than the file length, minus the line length, plus one because the length is one base, not zero based.
So I'm basically, I'm gonna take all the characters after the current line. So we move to the start of the line. If we have like five characters on the line, then everything after the line would be plus five from the start of the line, if that makes sense. So I'm moving everything, that, that number of characters back, that number of characters. That's what this, this is doing. So the pointer plus the length of the line that we're on, I'm gonna move it back. I know I don't need the separate line to increment the pointer. I'm just putting it here to be more spelled out. I might change that later because I could do this, but that's fine. Okay, so after I moved all the data back, I need to redraw it on the screen. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm basically going to write blanks over the rest of the file, and then I'm going to redraw the characters. So I'm going to save whatever line we're on by saving off the Y. So while we're not at the last line of the file yet, I'm gonna go to the start of the line that we're blinking out. I'll use J here, J less than 79. So each line can be up to 80 characters. We don't want to leave any characters on the line or else it'll look weird and won't be correct. So we need to blank out the complete line by doing this, by just printing a, a, a space pretty much. I guess I don't, if it's a one liner, I don't need the brackets. All right, after we deleted the line, by blinking it all out, I'm gonna reduce it. One less line in the file. Um, the number of bytes that the file was is going to decrease by the length of the, of the line we just deleted. Okay, and then I want to rewrite or redraw or reprint. <laughs> all characters from the new line that we moved up to the end of the file. Look into refactoring all of this for better performance, if needed, if it's slow. I don't know if it is, but I thought it might have been at the time, so I'll just leave that in there. Restore the Y. Restore the X value. Restore the file pointer from the current line that we previously deleted so we can redraw everything from the right point. So while we're not at the end of the file yet, if we're doing a new line, we do want to go down by one. Uh, y, Y, go down here. Print space visually. Reset the X value, add to the Y. Okay, if it's not a new line, then we'll just print the character that was there. And this will be at the file pointer. Okay, but regardless, we're gonna increment the file pointer. Um, I guess I don't need that bracket. Yeah, if it's a single line. So that goes to the while loop, yep, okay. Then after we printed everything out, I'm gonna move the cursor back to the line that we just deleted, because that's the space that we were on. Going to the start of the line. We'll move the cursor back there. And we'll reset the file pointer and offset. that we saved off. Okay, get the new line length. Since the line that we moved up by one after we deleted probably is different from the one that we deleted. The length is probably different. So we'll recalculate that. Could make like a helper function to get the line length because I do that in multiple places. Maybe I'll do that later. 
but while we're not at a new line, and, or if we're on the last line of the file now, while we're not at the end of the file, keep searching for the end of the file, or the end of the line. So increment the file pointer to search the next character, and increment the length. Then after we're done, we can reset to where we were, because we're at the start of the line after we deleted it, and then we'll go on. So that is a lot of stuff without seeing visually what happens, so I'm going to show that now. Um, but that will be, you know, restore file data at cursor. Okay. This will be restore cursor position to start of new line after the one we deleted and we moved it up. We're restoring pointer value, getting the length of it, restoring the file data, moving on. Okay, and that is control D to delete. Let's see if that works. Undeclared identifier save cursor. We need save Y instead of that. 437. That should be save Y. That's now 1C and not 1B. So let's do this. If we do a new file, line one, line two, and the third line. Let's see what happens. If we delete this line, let's be in the middle of it, like on this E, it should do line one and the third line. That should replace this one. This line should be blank. If I do control D, yeah, and there we go. So that does delete the line. And at the bottom it says Control D delete line. So that's good as well. So we can delete these, but since this is the last line now, I should not be able to delete that with a Control D. It doesn't do anything. The first line should work though. Yeah, and it does. So we can delete lines now. And then within the line, we can delete single characters um, and backspace. We go to the end, let's try doing a new enter key. I do enter, the E disappears. So I do need to work on putting new lines in and inserting new characters, but as far as deleting, backspace delete and deleting a line, seems to mostly work now. <laughs> so that's pretty good. That makes it a little bit better. Um, inserting new characters and new lines, I'll work on fixing that up next. Okay, let's change the inserting text. For a regular character or a new line, let's change that logic. That'll be all the way down here somewhere. After the movement keys, there we go. Let's print out input character down here. So this stuff will be new. Otherwise, normal character to screen, move forward. So I'm gonna delete all of this and just rewrite it all. <laughs> I'm assuming, I'm assuming insert mode. So we're gonna insert the new character, not override anything. It's not a replace mode or anything right now. First off, I'm gonna increment the length of the current line and the file length. Okay, if they put in for a new line, so they input the, the enter key, so that's a carriage return. I'm gonna change that. Well, I'm going to increment the uh, file length and lines first. So since I'm inserting a character, I want to move all the data in the file forward by one character, or one byte. And then I'll put in the current character that the user just entered. So for i equals file length and bytes minus the current offset while we're greater than zero. So we're going from basically from the end of the file backwards to where we currently are, moving everything back one character, or moving everything forward one character rather. Since we just made another space, I guess, in the file data by incrementing the length, this will be one more than it used to be before the character was inserted. Make it a little more readable. Okay, so we're going from the end, the new end of the file uh, back to where we currently are. I'm saying that character in the file data is the one before it. 
So I'm moving everything forward one character. So the end, the new end of the file will be the previous end of the file um, backwards until the current character in front of the cursor equals, you know, whatever the current cursor character was because we're inserting into the middle of the file. So then after that, we want to fill in that blank with whatever the character was just entered, whether it's a new line or not. Uh, if they put a carriage return, it will be a new line. So we'll put in the line feed. So convert carriage return to line feed. Um, and then to fill in the character in the file data, we'll put that in here. Put that in the file pointer. Since we moved everything forward one, the current one, we can overwrite with the thing we just entered. So that's what this is doing. So overwrite current uh, character at cursor. Okay, and then after we put in the current character, I'm gonna reprint everything after the character. So, because it'll be changed, we need to reprint the rest of the line with the new character, or we need to reprint sort of the rest of the file if it's a new line. We want to reprint, you know, we want to move down a line and print everything out at the new position. So I'll put that, start that here. Reprint the file data starting from cursor position. So I'm going to save off the values first. Save off everything just in case. Okay, so if we put in a new line, then we'll reprint all of the lines until the new end of the file. Uh, if we didn't print in a new line, we just have to reprint the current line that we're on. But if we did do a new line, we have to move down in the screen and print everything else, you know, one line after where it previously was. And since we changed it to a line feed, we can check if it's the line feed now. And first I'm going to blink out the rest of the current line, if it's a new line. So starting at the cursor X position, going up until 80, the end of the line, we're going to print spaces out to blank it out. So to blank out the line, we're going to print spaces from that position till the end of, you know, 80 characters. So after that, we want to blank out the rest, the other lines and the rest of the file. So while this is less than the file length in lines, which was incremented up here, if it's a new line, so it should go down to the correct length. Yeah, so that should be okay. For all of the all of these lines, we're going to blank them out. So I zero to eighty. We're just going to write spaces again. Doing that. Then after we blanked out the rest, I'm going to reprint all the the data in the file. Reprint file data from the current position. So restore the cursors first. And then until the end of the file, so while we're not at the null byte, uh, again, if we're printing out a new line, then we need to move down. And then we'll go down to the next line. Okay, else it's not a new line. We'll just print out the normal character. Character at the file pointer. Okay, and then we'll increment the file pointer by default for both cases. Uh, don't need that. If it's just a one-liner. That'll reprint all the data back out. And that'll be good. Okay, other than that, if they did not put in a new line... Then we just want to reprint the current line because we added a new character. So until we reach the end of the line character, or if we're on the last line of the file, until we reach the end of the file, 
null byte, we want to print out the character at the file pointer. And then just increment the file pointer. So that's easy enough. So after we've printed out all the new data for the current line or for the rest of the file, I want to move the cursor forward in case we entered a new line or not. But I also need to restore our place where we were. So restore the data for the cursors and the file pointer and offset. And then since we inserted a new character, we can increment the pointer and offset. Um, if they put in a new line, then we want to go down to the next line after we restored our place. So go down to the beginning of the next line. If insert a new line, go to start of next line. Okay. And since we move down, we need to get the length again of the next line. So I'm going to do that again. So until we reach a new line character or until we reach the end of the file, if we're on the last line, we're just getting the length. So increase the pointer and the offset. Might not need to increase the offset actually, because we can just restore it. But that's okay. And increment the length. Oh. Need another parenthesis, that's why. Okay, and then we want to include the end of line or end of file bytes, otherwise it won't be included in the line length and it'll be off by one. We don't want that. Move to the start of the line in the file data. I'll do that as well because we went to the end of the line to see where the end of the line is, so I need to move that back to the start of the line because I did it this way instead of a better way. So you can subtract the line length, but since file pointer is zero based and line length is one based, we need to subtract an extra one. If they didn't enter in a new line, then we can just move the cursor forward pretty much. We don't have to go to the start of the next line, we can just move the cursor. This needs to be there. Okay. And then after we move the cursor, whether to the start of the next line or just to the next position, we need to move it on the screen visually. So I'll put this here. Move cursor on screen. And then since we just inserted a character, we do now have unsaved changes. Unsave changes. Okay, so until they save a file, we'll have the little asterisk on screen saying, hey, you haven't saved yet. That's not good. That's at the while once. We need the extra bracket there. Yeah. For the text editor. Might have increased the size again, yeah. So that's at 1D now, that's okay. Uh, or 1C, yeah. That is all right. Move the screen here. So editor, new text file. So if we're inserting new stuff in the line, it's going to work, you know, normally. If we go down to the next line, that'll still work normally. But now we can, you know, after the new deletes and everything, we can delete and insert back and it'll work. Or we can do a backspace. And we'll go back. And then we can insert new characters there. So the issue is if we want to put a new line in. So let's put on this I, I'll press enter. Now it goes down, it prints that line, it still keeps the previous end of uh, the new line, so then this is now on line three. I don't have undo support, so undo would be good as well, but I can do control D to delete that. We can go back here, press enter again. That's the new line too. Maybe we go in there. Uh, we can put a three and delete that. I think I pressed an E there, delete that. There we go. This is line two, this can be line four. And now we can insert and delete reasonably well. 
Not great, but reasonably well. We can move around, do home and end, delete lines, delete characters, insert new characters, press backspace. So I think we're good, at least as far as basic editing of files is concerned. So I can start doing more stuff now that we can input source files. Um, but yeah, I think there was only a couple other small changes I had to do. So I changed where the lines in the hex editor were for the keybinds. Keybinds hex editor, like I don't need that up here because I have it in multiple places. Like I don't need it in load file either. I shouldn't need it in load file. I have it in save hex program, I have it. In hex editor, I have it. So here I should not need it. Yeah, here it's okay. This I probably don't want because I can just write it within the hex editor. So that's what I'm going to do. So I know I just deleted it from a few places, but the only place I'm going to have this is in save hex program where it currently is and in the hex editor code because I don't need to write the thing on screen other than in those two places. So I can put it here. Um, let me get the actual text back. <laughs> Do Y, Y, go back. Okay. So I'm going to put it there. So when we first enter the hex editor, I'll put it at the bottom of the screen. That's all this is doing. So I don't have to keep track and keep writing it in separate areas. And I can save some bytes by not needing it in those other places. So all that's going to do is just write the text. If we do a bin file, it's still going to write it at the bottom. And if we save the file, it's still going to write it at the bottom. But we don't need that in all the other places. That's just a waste. So that's just reducing some duplication. And the only other thing I had was, I believe, just the control C. Yeah. So I made a control C um, sort of keybind in the text editor. Um, so I'll put that down here. I'll put it in the the key binds as well. I think I did it before control D, so I'll do that. If I have enough room, we'll see. But control C, I had a sort of change file. So you'll, you can change the, uh, the name of the file and the extension. So I'll put change file name extension, which I don't know if this is now 80 characters. It's 92. Yeah, that's more. Um, maybe I'll just do this as return. <laughs> well, actually, that would only be by 10, wouldn't it? That's 82. What did I do for this? I didn't put spaces in between. Uh, change name extension. I didn't put file either. So I got to save some space until I change the length of a file we can do. That's okay. I'll do save. Change name extension. That should make sense, hopefully. That's 110. Okay. That just saves file size there. Um, saves the line length size. So I'm making a control C. So control C. In case we want to update the file when we're currently editing it, we don't want to save a new file every time. I might make a thing to copy later. But right now we're just saying, you know, if you want to save it with a new file name and you don't want to go back to rename it, since renaming doesn't currently change the extension anyway, this is the only place you could do that. So I needed to make a, a command for that. Or a keybind for that, rather. Okay, so I save off the cursor data to begin with. I remove the cursor because we're kind of saving it. So same as with saving, we're going to remove it from the screen and then we can redraw it later. I'm going to write blank line at the bottom. I'll write the file name screen again. So it'll say enter file name or input file name so we can, you know, save over it. 
and we'll move the cursor there so the user can input that name. This will be kind of duplicated code from the save file command up here, but oh well, I might change that later. <laughs> So the old file name, the one that it currently is, I might be able to use string copy here, actually. Change file name i equals editor file name i. Yeah, I can probably do string copy or string end copy to be sure. So change file name, we'll put an editor file name, 10 characters. And then they'll input the file name. So this is going to overwrite the editor file name. And then we're gonna save the new file with that new saved file name. After they input the new name, they'll input the extension, input new file name, input new file extension. This will be file extension string with the cursor again. Okay. Or i equals zero. i less than three, i plus plus. The file type string again is going to be get key. And then we're going to print that out. Whatever you just entered. Print it to the screen and then we'll move the cursor afterwards. Okay. And then we're going to call a rename file with that new name to save to file table. Overwrite file table. Okay. So we'll rename with the changed file name that we did up there. We're overriding that, 10 characters with the new editor file name, which is also 10 characters. Okay. And after we changed it, we can call save file again so you don't have to resave in case you made unsaved changes. Um, it should work, so, I mean, I do want to catch errors, but I think, I think it'll work. Hopefully it'll work. Editor file name, editor file type. It is one sector right now. I need to change that to be the actual size, but that's okay. So if this, if it's zero, I need to change it to return one so it looks better. I'll just do that. And I'll save errors here. I'm not going to handle that right now because I'm lazy. We'll just rewrite the key binds at the bottom to overwrite the file messages and stuff. And we'll restore the cursor position where it was before we saved. Move the cursor there. Keep retyping that wrong. And then we should be good to go. Since we saved the file, we can set the unsaved changes flag off. Saved file, no unsaved changes now. And then we can continue and get the next input from the user, all right. So that'll get a new name and extension, rename the file table, save the new data to disk, and we should be good to go on that. So it might be, yeah, 1E now. So the editor did go up in size a bit. It's sure to go up a lot more later on when we do more fancy things. But right now, I think we should be good to go, hopefully. We have the text at the bottom, change name text, control D. So if we make a file, and we save it, save it as text. It's in update mode. If we make a change, like delete this line, the update has the star next to it now. 
So we have unsaved changes, or if we insert a new character, it'll have that. Might have some issues with inserting, deleting, but I think I just fixed those. So we might still have some issues depending where the cursor is and everything. Um, but that's okay. But if we save this, you know, we go back. I didn't save those changes, but that's all right. Didn't need to reboot either, but we went there. So let's go back and load it. So we have these. Let's make a change. This will be like line two now. We can either resave it, and it won't do anything but get rid of the star. And if we reload it, it'll have those changes. Or maybe we want to put in a new line here, and then we'll change the file for a new name. This will be test text two. We'll say the extension is, I don't know, ASM, it doesn't matter. But now it will have changed the name and extension. We go back and it has that updated name and extension because we did the change within there. And we can load it here. So we should be good to go and develop more advanced tools and then we can type in text and edit it kind of arbitrarily. So I think I'm gonna start working on like a tool chain, like an assembler or something. Been working on a small one lately. It's still pretty buggy, but when I get that figured out, I'll make a video on it and uh, we'll see. We can like hopefully write regular assembly pr programs, have our own assembler to assemble them within the OS and run programs and develop and save them uh, within here. That's what I'd like to move towards. So I'll either work on that or maybe a memory manager, like a physical memory manager or something for the next part of this. But other than that, if you want to see anything specific, let me know. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you all for watching and uh, I'll see you on the next one.